Greetings, my name is José Nuno Macedo and I will be presenting our work on zipping strategies and attribute grammars. So, uh, as an introduction, there are two uh, very powerful systems for uh, language processing that are typically not used together. The first is strategic term rewriting, in which we use strategies or recursion schemes to traverse uh, a data structure and apply uh, transformations for uh, the different nodes. And the second um, technique is uh, attribute grammars, which allows us to define attributes uh, for uh, given uh, uh, nodes. Um, they are power very powerful uh, strat uh, techniques, and we are going to see that uh, later in the slides, but they are typically not combined together. Uh, and here in our library, uh, strategic uh, a Haskell embedding of both uh, strategies that we are combi combining uh, with uh, attribute grammars, uh, we can get the best of both worlds. So to combine these two um, uh, techniques, one thing that we need is a common denominator in this case, it's the zipper. The zipper is a data structure uh, that we build from another data structure and it allows us to traverse the original data structure in a controlled way. So here we have two functions that we can use to create a zipper, to zipper, and we can use from zipper to recover the original data from the zipper. And here we have an example. Uh, for example, this could be a parse tree from a parser or to, could represent uh, um, some language, for example. And we can assume that we are focused on a given node, in this case, in the node var. Um, and then we can change uh, our focus to different nodes using traversal functions, such as up. In this case, we'd, we would go up into the add node. We could use right to go to the node to the right, in this case const, or we can use down to go deeper into the nesting, in this case we, we will go into the A node. Uh, so finally uh, we can navigate all we want, uh, we want to change the data we can use get hole to get the data in the, in the zipper is pointing towards and we can use set hole to change that data. So this uh, zipper data structure is extremely powerful for navigating data structures and we are going to use this uh, in our embedding. So uh, our running example in this presentation will be uh, Haskell let expressions, uh, not necessarily only Haskell but uh, Haskell implements this type of let expressions. Uh, we can have for example uh, nested lets, so here we have a let expression inside a let expression. We can have out of order declarations, for example here we use b, which is only declared later on in the same scope. Um, and now we can create a data type, a Haskell data type, to store this kind of expressions. So here we have it, it's a bit complex, uh, not much, but we have three different data types, so a lot of constructors, some of them are easy to understand, for example const int represents a, a constant integer, uh, add x, exp, exp, exp would be adding to expressions, um, but still it's a lot of data to process. Yeah. And of course if we want to represent the same let using our new data types, we get this huge thing, which quickly becomes very uh, complicated to understand and to, to, to know how to change intuitively. And we will want to change uh, this type of uh, lets. We will want to um, optimize um, expressions uh, in particular. Uh, for example, uh, adding with zero, we do not want to, we want to replace that with the expression itself. Um, these types of op optimizations. And for that we have uh, seven uh, optimization rules that we took from the paper Strategic Tree Rewriting and Attribute Grammars by Lucas Kramer. Uh, and here we have our seven rules. 
And the first six are relatively simple. Stuff like adding e to 0 returns e, or adding 0 to e also returns e. Adding constant a constant b returns constant a plus b. Um, the rule number seven, number 7 is, however, a bit more complicated. This rule um, says that if we have a variable of name id, and we have in our environment of declared, uh, declared variables, if we have the name id with a certain expression e, then we are replacing with the expression e. So here we are trying to replace a variable by its definition. Uh, for this we have to look into the environment, so we have to know contextual information. We have to know uh, for the place we are uh, looking and trying to apply this rule, we need to know the environment uh, around it to see if the variable is declared. If we try to pass this into Haskell, uh, following uh, a very specific formatting, here we have expert uh, is a function that takes an expression and maybe returns an expression, uh, and we are trying to apply the first six rules, which we can apply successfully. If any of these, patter these uh, patterns are matched, we just return the simplified version. Um, we do not apply the seventh rule because we have no way of knowing the context in which we are currently operating. So we do not know if uh, a certain variable is or isn't declared. And then, for any other case that doesn't match any of these rules, we just return nothing. This function is very simple. It's just uh, the it's almost equal as the rules themselves. Um, however, our let um, uh, our let data type was a bit more complex. We have three da different data types intertwined, several constructors, uh, and we only want to apply expert to expressions, and we want to ignore everything else. Fortunately, we can do that with um, strategies, and here, uh, without boring you too much with the explanation, uh, we are applying a type preserving strategy, which is a strategy that does not change the type, it's only a transformation, and what we are applying is innermost step. Innermost uh, represents applying the same thing over and over again as many times as possible, um, So, which we actually want to do here, and our step is uh, the composition, ad hoc tp is composition, the composition of expert, the function that we defined here, with fail. So this step basically says that we apply expert, uh, if it does not work, we apply fail, so it definitely doesn't work. And innermost will try to apply this to the whole data structure as many times as possible, ensuring that uh, when it stops trying, then there are no more possible uh, optimizations to apply. The interesting thing here is that we only have to focus on the nodes that we actually want to change. We could have 500 different data types intertwined. Uh, we only had to express one if we wanted to change one, and we are going to see that again later. Um, now we are going to take a very quick look into attribute grammars. Um, the example here is very simple. It's just a, a level attribute, which is an attribute that for a given uh, node, uh, it will compute how uh, deeply nested it is. So for example, if we are at the, at the root, or if we have at a let node that it's uh, near the root, which is the start of the zipper, then our level is zero. But if we are in a let that is um, nested inside a nested let, then our uh, level will be computed by computing the level of our parent and adding 1. We have different types of attributes. We have um, synthesized attributes 
if we are computing them using bottom-up information or inherited attributes if we are computing them using top-down information. I am only trying to provide a very simple example of attribute grammars. Uh, but in our paper we have a, a, a graph, a visual representation of the all the scope rules of let expressions using attribute grammars. So, um, assuming we have level uh, as an attribute as we showed before, as well as environment, which is an attribute that can compute all the declared variables uh, at a certain point, then we can define a new function, xpc, uh, that only has two cases. The second one is where we do nothing. The first one is xpc uh, for a given variable i, given that we are at this place on the zipper, so this, this is new, given that we are at this place of the zipper, we are going to compute the environment, we are going to compute the current level, and we are going to use an auxiliary function expand to try to find the variable i with this level in our environment. So for example, if we somewhere uh, had the declared that i equals 3 and then later on this function tries to uh, optimize variable i uh, it will look at the level uh, to check if the, the, the position of the usage of the variable is valid it will check the environment, it will find that i equals 3 and then here we are going to expand, expand i into the number 3 now we can go at our opt function uh, for the applying of the optimization uh, in which we use the, the innermost strategy that we have seen before and we are going to keep it almost equal but we are only going to add, add here ad hoc tpz with xpc so this is basically sequential, sequ sequential composition also with xpc so step will try to apply expert if it fails, it will apply XPC, and if it fails, well, it fails. In this case, so we uh, managed to define the seventh rules, in which the seventh was uh, more complex because we needed contextual information, and for that we used attributes to define our strategy. Uh, we also have an example in which we do the reverse. We define an attribute using uh, strategies and the attribute we are defining is errors which computes the name of uh, the list of names that violate the scope rules that is uh, the list of errors uh, things like double declaration of variables or usage of variables that were not declared um, in terms of uh, benchmarking and testing our uh, library besides the whole uh, let expressions uh, running example. We also have uh, Haskell code smell elimination uh, in which we found some uh, some co uh, code smells which are uh, uh, technically correct correct but bad practices uh, of writing code and we wrote uh, strategies to remove them automatically. So we have here a small example this redundant boolean function is applied to hs exp types which are a type uh, that is part of the Haskell source code data types uh, which are extremely co extremely complex but we are only looking at the speci specifically specifically at uh, expressions and when we have stuff like uh, true equals a then we just return a or if we have a equals true we also just return a or false equals a, we return uh, not a. So this is a very simple uh, mistake that typically first year students uh, make a lot and we have here some code to optimize it automatically and we are using this redundant boolean function together with join list function, null list function and redundant if function all together uh, in a one simple strategy that is going to be applied into a HS module which represents 
a Haskell source code file. Um, we do this uh, for the Haskell source code, which contain, contains 30 data types totalizing 116 constructors, and we are applying for elimination rules, one of which was shown in the slide before. And now we can compare this approach with a similar implementation, but using Strafunsky, which is an already existing strategic programming library for the Haskell programming language. Uh, Strafunsky, however, does not allow the usage of attributes and attribute grammars, so it is less expressive. Um, for this, we are using 150 Haskell projects developed by first-year students. Uh, there are a total of 100, uh, 1,139 Haskell files, but because some of them have, have bugs or they do not compile, only uh, 1,000 exactly are synthetically correct. So we run the Haskell smell eliminators uh, implemented with both libraries in all uh, code and we eliminated uh, exactly 850 code smells and this small table shows the, the results uh, the source code for both libraries the Im implementation using both libraries is 22 lines so very similar um, however in terms of runtime strategic is set 6 seconds slower uh, that is because the strategic has additional overhead of handling the zipper uh, which it needs uh, for uh, possible usages with attribute grammars. In terms of memory consumption we have similar results. Finally, we participated in the LDTA tool challenge uh, which, which is a challenge divided into five tasks and which only three of them were interesting to us so these tasks are for parsing at pretty printing, name binding, type checking, the sugaring and C code generation. And we only care about name binding, type checking and the sugaring because they are the most adequate for uh, our library. And this was all performed on the Oberon Zero language. And we opted to work on an interme intermediate level of complexity of this language, which is level two, uh, because it is relatively complex. We have more complex constructs such as four cycles and um, uh, cases, but we do not have too much uh, overhead on com and com complicated code and we can still keep our example relatively small. And we are comparing this with Kiyama, which is a library for strategic programming and attribute grammars uh, for the Scala programming language. We are not, not comparing runtime because it would not be a fair comparison, because we are using different languages. We are comparing number of lines of code, which is also not a fair comparison. However, uh, we believe that this difference from 230 and 23 to almost 600 lines of code, uh, we can convince you that our library is also very um, uh, powerful in terms of expression. Thank you for your time and uh, have a great day.